How are you? Are you awake? How many of you already had Easter brunch? All right, I'll be quick then. I'll be quick. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Luke chapter 24. I'm going to grab a music stand here. Luke chapter 24. We just read the story of the first moments of Resurrection Sunday. And this morning as we open the text together, what I would love to do is follow the story along as the news of the resurrection started to spread to the disciples to follow how it is that Jesus brought faith and belief to his people. So if you're finding it, it's Luke chapter 24. We read the beginning. Now I'm going to read starting in verse 13. As Jesus comes, encounters some of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. Luke writes, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Are, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, this is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body they came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Let me pray for us as we open God's word this morning. And Father, I pray for anyone in this room this morning who hears this story but does not see Jesus, that you would reveal yourself to us. Open our eyes to believe in you more. When we think of the man who, who prayed to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. We pray that you would grow in us a strength and resolve in our faith to trust and believe and live and walk in these beautiful, magnificent truths that we're celebrating this morning. And thank you that you come to us and you open our eyes to see you. We pray that you would do that for us today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our house, we celebrated Easter yesterday because today I'm, I'm here with all of you. And so we decided that it would be important for us to read the Easter story to our kids. We've got six kids. We gathered them around the table. And I don't know if you've ever tried to read a story to six children all at the same time, especially a long one. Uh, it got a little bit rough, right? And so we got to the crucifixion, right? And everybody was kind of tracking. But then as we kind of walked past Good Friday, I could see that the kids were drifting off and not listening anymore. I'm like, oh no, they're going to miss the good part, right? So I brought in the resurrection and read the story, finished it up, and, and still had this feeling like, okay, I don't know if they really got it. And so Jessica, my wife, said, hey, well, let's ask the kids if they understand the meaning of the story. And so I said, okay, hey kids, can you tell us what Easter is all about? And Peyton, our, one of our four-year-olds, turns and she says, Jesus died on the cross. I'm like, that's, that's good. That's sweet. That's right. That's true. But that's not the end of the story, right? So I said, and what happened after that? And her eyes got big and she smiled. She said, then the Easter Bunny brings us candy! <laughs> Our six-year-old decided to take advantage of that opportunity to mess up her worldview even more. And so he smiled and he turned to her and said, no, 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 Peyton. Easter is when the Easter bunny brings the resurrection stone to Jesus. <laughs> I'm like, that's Harry Potter, I think. That's not even, <laughs> like we're introducing new mythology into this story. It's one of those moments as a parent that I realized, I think I'm messing up my kids with these baskets and the chocolate, right? Easter is probably the Christian holiday or maybe even the holiday at large, that has the most crazy, weird symbolism of all. You ever notice that? Where did the Easter bunny come from? 
Was there an Easter bunny on Resurrection Sunday in the Garden of Gethsemane or the Garden of the Garden Tomb? <laughs> and why does the Easter bunny bring eggs? Did the bunny lay the eggs? Right? Is that the miracle? <laughs> Did the Easter bunny steal the eggs from the coop of the Easter chicken? And <laughs> is the miracle of Easter you crack open the egg, but instead of a yolk that comes out, it's a chocolate candy or some money or something? Right? There's all these different stories that I can see my kids just jumbling them up in their minds. And the, okay, the most important thing is that there's candy everywhere. There's some toys. There's baskets. There's an egg hunt. Oh yeah, and Jesus died. It's like okay, hold on. You've missed the most important thing. Ironically, when we think about the Easter story, the most important part of the story, even amidst all the craziness of the symbolism in our culture with Easter, the, the resurrection of Jesus is probably the hardest thing to believe out of all. Sometimes it's easier to think about a bunny laying eggs than the Think about God becoming human flesh, dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and then taking his life back up and ushering in a new season of life and health and vitality and faith. I, I don't know where you've come from, right? If you have grew up in church or this is your first Sunday or, or whatever, but I think we can be honest that sometimes the Easter story is a beautiful one. We say he is risen indeed. Half to celebrate, but then half to kind of convince ourselves because the story of the resurrection of the Son of God is a hard story to believe. Is it okay to be skeptical on Easter? Do you ever feel guilty coming in and you've got doubts mixed with faith? And you think of that man in the Bible, like we talked about before, who says, I believe, help my unbelief. It's like simultaneously we want to believe, we know we do believe, but we've also got this doubt right alongside it. And we pray, Jesus, on this day of all days, let my faith become sight. Let me believe in my heart what my mouth is saying. I know this is true. Help me know this is true. Now, the reason I think this is important for us to talk about is that when we think of the Easter story, we normally just think of that garden tomb and the women coming and the miracle. I'm like, oh my goodness, he's risen, right? But I think we need to understand that, that God saw fit to help us to see that at every turn in the Easter Sunday, throughout the entire Easter day, the first Easter, every moment Jesus met someone in his resurrected state, he was met with someone who doubted. And think of Mary, the first person who saw Jesus, and she was talking to him, and she thought he was the gardener. <laughs> they've hidden my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. The women go and tell the disciples. It says they didn't believe it. So then they come to the tomb themselves, and then Peter sees the linen cloths, and he goes, and he peers into the tomb and takes in the scene. And Luke says, they walked away wondering what happened. As we look at this text this morning, what we're going to see is a group of disciples who met Jesus and were filled with doubt. And yet by the end of the chapter... They're worshiping him, they're believing in him, and their eyes are opened to who he really is. So as we walk through this text, I want us to figure out how we can take that journey. How we can get to the place, even on Easter Sunday, that by the end of the day, we are convinced, we know it, we see with our eyes. What we know in our heads is true. And the story of Jesus on the road of Emmaus is one of my favorite stories in the Bible because I feel like resurrected Jesus is even funnier than before resurrected Jesus. I just, I feel like he's toying with these people, but I know that he's not, right? He's still God, he's still perfect, but the story tells us that there was these two men who were on their way to this town called Emmaus, and as they were talking, they were wrestling with the events that had happened over that holy weekend, and as they walked down the street, Jesus himself, <laughs> Jesus himself shows up and starts to walk down the road with them. And Jesus plays it super cool. And I wish, well, maybe someday when I resurrect and we all resurrect, we can play jokes on each other. I don't know, but <laughs> and Jesus comes up to these guys, Jesus, and he says, hey, what are you guys talking about? They're like, we're talking about everything that happened this weekend. <laughs> and Jesus says, 
What are you talking about? Like, about Jesus? And then they say to Jesus, are you the only person in this whole region who haven't heard about the events of Jesus of Nazareth? And then they start to tell Jesus what Jesus was all about, right? He was a prophet, amazing in word and deed, and, and we thought he was going to be the one to restore Israel, but then we handed him over to put to death, and he was crucified. But then the women said that they saw him. We don't know if we believe it. And Jesus is like, uh-huh. Hmm. <laughs> and as they sit there and look at Jesus' face and ridicule him for not knowing about himself, <laughs> and Jesus turns back to these two. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, he says to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. How foolish you are. Like, we get that. They're talking to Jesus about Jesus. How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. When I read this text, I see something really powerful for us. And the truth is that we can stand face to face with Jesus Christ himself and still have no idea who we're looking at. You can walk physically, literally, down the street with Jesus, right? And these were disciples. They knew Jesus. You can walk down the street with Jesus and still doubt that he's alive. We see this over and over again in this chapter, all these people encountering Jesus and not believing in Jesus. It helps us to realize that maybe there's something wrong in us and that causes us to doubt. You know, maybe you've had seasons in your life where you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is there and he is real and he is listening. Or maybe you prayed and God answered. Maybe you met him in a powerful way. Maybe you saw him moving in a way that was unmistakable. Maybe you had a moment in your life or several moments in your life that you said at that time, I will never doubt again because of what I saw today. And then like three days later, you found yourself thinking, I don't know if any of this is even true. You ever had that happen to you? There are seasons where, where we believe deeply and we know it. And yet it feels like there's something in us that just keeps pulling us back into the darkness. Pulling us back to a place of doubt. Turning us back to a place where we just question everything we saw before when we were in the light. And if that's ever happened to you, take heart in knowing that that happened on Easter Sunday with Jesus' own disciples. Because there's something in us that is broken, that we can even see Jesus with our eyes, but our souls are darkened from seeing him for who he really is. And Jesus starts lecturing these guys on the Bible. <laughs> hey, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, and he walks through the Old Testament. And, and as he's talking to them, they say later that their hearts inside them are warming. Like, oh, there's something about this guy that's different, right, you think? And as Jesus gets close to the place where these people are going to have dinner, they, they kind of stop at a fork in the road. And, and Luke says that Jesus pretended like he was going to keep walking. Like, all right, guys, it's been great. I'm going to see you later, right? Like messing with them again. Again, I love resurrection Jesus. Messing with them. Yeah, hey, I'm out of here. See ya. Have a great time at dinner, right? But they're like, oh, I don't know. I like this guy. He, he should come have dinner with us. And so they ask him, hey, come and stay with us. Stay with us. This is what, what, they, what they say in verse 28 through 29, it says, As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over, so he went in to stay with them. I love that these disciples don't even know that they're praying to Jesus right now. They don't even know that what they're saying, the question they're asking, is a prayer. And yet the prayer that they pray on that intersection on the highway is the prayer that makes all the difference in their lives. They say to Jesus when they were doubting him. They say to Jesus when they don't recognize him. They say to Jesus when they know he's doing something, but they don't know who he is yet. They say to him, stay with us. Now, if you're at a place in your life now where you're 
plagued with doubts or you're riddled with fears or whatever it is and you feel like you're in the dark spiritually, your soul is kind of in a place that's not good, one of the best, most important prayers you can pray even today is, Jesus, stay with me. Jesus, I feel like I've lost you, but stay with me. Jesus, I feel like I'm in a tunnel and the lights just got turned off and I don't know where I are, where I am, but I know you used to be with me. Stay with me. I, I, I know you might be thinking about leaving me, but stay with me. Don't leave me. Come with me. I can't see you, but I trust you there somewhere. Don't walk away. And we know from everywhere in the Bible, including this passage, that when we ask Jesus to stay with us, he's not going anywhere. In fact, Jesus comes to these disciples and he has dinner with them. And as he has dinner with them, he starts to open their eyes to who he really is. At one point in the meal, he takes bread like he did on Good Friday and he breaks it and gives it to his disciples. And as Jesus breaks the bread, all of a sudden, it's like the scales fall off of their eyes. And the disciples that were walking with them down the road say, it's him, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. And then boom, he disappears. Again, toying with them on Easter Sunday. I don't know where he went. Right? And so then they start talking about this is, this is Jesus. We were, how did we not see it? Didn't our hearts burn within us as we walked down the road to Emmaus, they said? How did we not know this is him? We saw it. And they look at each other and say, we've got to tell everyone. So they get up from the table. They book it down the street. They find the other disciples and they start telling them, you guys wouldn't believe what happened. We were walking down the street and Jesus came up and for some reason we couldn't recognize him, but we had dinner and he broke the bread and all of a sudden our eyes were opened and we saw him. He's real. He's alive. And then he shows up and he says, peace be with you. And you would think that they would hug him, but that's not what they did. The disciples who were talking about the fact that Jesus was truly alive at that moment, instead, verse 37 says, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. <laughs> Scooby-Doo fans, a ghost. <laughs> they were literally just talking about the fact that he was alive. They just ate dinner with him. They just saw his physical hands break bread in front of them. They knew he wasn't a ghost. And yet the first time he shows up in the room, their faith is out the window again. Oh, it's the ghost of Jesus coming to haunt us for killing him. What? This is why it's good that I'm not Jesus. I would have given up on these folks a long time ago. <laughs> And Jesus doesn't give up on him. He, he turns to the disciples. And he asks them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise up in your minds? Why are you troubled? Where are these doubts coming from? I love that phrase. Why do these doubts rise in your mind? It's like there's this water level of doubt that just keeps rising, like trying to drown us. It's like there's something in them that's trying to drown out their faith. And so they'll see Jesus for a moment. They'll recognize the truth. They'll get this glimpse, this clarity. The doubts disappear. They get flushed down the drain. And then all of a sudden it comes back up again. And Jesus says, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? What's wrong with you? There's something broken in you. I'm standing right in front of you. He says, I'm not a ghost. Feel the, the scars in my hands. Feel my side. I have flesh and bones. You saw me break the bread, right? I'm not a ghost. <laughs> Why do doubts rise in your minds? I don't think Jesus was wondering why doubts rose up in their minds. I think Jesus knew exactly why doubts rose up in their minds. I don't think Jesus is wondering why you have doubts. I think Jesus knows exactly why you have doubts. Because Jesus knows that in the world we live in, in the state that we live in, in the condition that we are in, doubts are, are like this cancer that keeps trying to come back and destroy us. I was thinking this week of a story in the book of John where a man named Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and he's got a little bit of an experience like the disciples did here. He's gotten some glimpses that Jesus might be who he says he is, but he can't figure it out. He can't understand the truth. And, and so he comes to Jesus, and he starts a conversation about him and his religious buddies. He says, teacher, we, we can see 
that you're a prophet from God. Because no one could do the miraculous signs that you are doing unless God is with them. And Jesus looks back at Nicodemus and he says, okay, that's where you've got it wrong. You say that you can see that I'm a prophet. He says, Nicodemus, I tell you the truth. No one can see the, spirit, the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Nicodemus, you see that I do miracles because you're physically alive. You can't miss it. But you can't see who I am because you have not yet been spiritually born. There's a part of you that's dead, and the part of you that's not yet alive is the part of you that you need to have faith in me. He says no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Right? That's, when King, that's when Nicodemus says, you want me to go back and get born again? He's like, that's not what I'm talking about. He says you were born physically, but you've not yet been born spiritually. The Spirit of God needs to open your eyes, and then you'll be able to see. And there's a chance that you're here this Sunday, and the reason that you have doubts, honestly, is because you have no spiritual life in you. You're physically alive, obviously, right? You're here. You're hearing this message with your ears, obviously, because you're here. You're seeing what I'm saying with your own eyes. And yet there's something that's not clicking, that's not resonating, because the spiritual part of your life has not yet been resurrected. Jesus says spirit gives birth to spirit. And until the Spirit of God awakens you, you won't be able to understand this. But that's the beauty of the message of Easter, is that life has come. The Spirit has raised Jesus from the dead, and he walks out of the tomb, ushering in new life to all who will believe. And he says, turn to me, believe in me, place your faith in me, and you will receive the life freely, without cost. Just come and get it. So you can receive that life today by simply turning to Jesus, and the lights will turn on for you, and you will see who he is. And yet for most of us in this room who would claim to be Christians, who know Jesus, we, we find ourselves more in the shoes of the disciples in this passage who, who find this water level of doubt keeps coming up and blinding our eyes to see who he really is. And that's normal. It happens. It happens to the best of us. And yet I love how Jesus walks with these disciples and brings the light back to their eyes. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus met a man, encountered a man. His friends brought to him a man who, who was blind. He couldn't see. And one of the miracles that Jesus did all, all the time was he healed blind people. I think the reason that he did that was to show physically what happens spiritually when we encounter Jesus. And he comes to this man who cannot see and his friends want him to heal the blind man. And so Jesus kind of takes some spit and puts it on the man's eyes. And, and all of a sudden, light comes back into his body. And he asks the man, can you see? And this is from the Bible. This is not something that I make up. This is from the Bible. The man, the man says, I can see people, but they look like trees walking around. Right? Like he still has cataracts or something. Like he can't see, see. But light has entered his eyes. He's kind of there. He's kind of illuminated, but he's not there in clarity. And so Jesus sticks with him. He does it again. He says, now check it out. And the man's like, I can see now. And Jesus abides with this man as he slowly brings him to fullness of sight. And that's the exact same thing I see with Jesus in this passage, even on this whole Easter Sunday in Luke 24, is that he's coming alongside his people who are blind spiritually to the truth of the resurrection. And he sticks with them until they regain their sight. He comes up on the road and their eyes are kept from seeing him. He walks with them and their hearts start becoming warmed to who he is. They start to catch a glimpse of who he is and he disappears and their faith disappears. Then he comes back and he abides with them and their eyes are opened again and, and they're starting to see him but they can't really understand it. And then finally, at the end of this encounter, as Jesus is explaining his identity to them, it says in verse 45 that then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them the story again about Moses and the prophets and the Christ and the suffering and the resurrection. And he sticks with them until they can see. Maybe you want a moral of the story on Easter. I think the moral of the story is that Jesus invites us to continue walking with him until he can give us our spiritual sight. I think the human condition of humanity, of you, of me, is that there, as we live in these bodies on this side of the resurrection for us, 
There are always going to be doubts that try to plague us, and yet the invitation from Jesus is stick with me, abide in me, walk with me, and I will bring the lights on in your faith. I was reminded this week of those, have you seen those flashlights? I brought one up today. That, that you have like an emergency, there's a little crank on them. Have you seen this? Right? If you haven't seen it, this is a really weird illustration. But uh, the way that this works, power goes out, there's no power, your battery's are dead, doesn't matter because you got this crank, right? And the crank creates power. And if you crank it, the light turns on and then turns back off again. If you crank it a couple times, the light shines bright, then it turns back off again. But if you crank it for like a full minute, the battery charges and you can shine around your house for an hour. I think a lot of times this is how our our faith is, right? You come on Easter Sunday, and your faith is dark, it's dim, and then you get a glimpse of Jesus, and it's like you turn the thing, and the lights turn on, you're like, yes, Jesus is real. Then you get back in the parking lot, it's like, boom. (laughs) Oh, I got to go back to church, right? You come back the next week, you're like, oh, 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 yeah. (laughs) And I see this in the disciples, right? Yes, oh, it's a ghost. And yet Jesus, in his grace, In his mercy, he walks with them. He puts his head on the crank and says, just keep spinning. Just keep spinning. Right? Eventually, the light will come on and stay on. And yet you've had seasons like this, right? You go to church. You're in the small group. You you do your thing. You read the Bible. You pray. And it feels like, wow, things are starting to pick up. And I'm seeing and I'm understanding and I believe this. And I don't know how I ever had doubts before. And this is crazy. I used to be such a bad person. Now I'm an amazing Christian. La, 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 la. And then something happens. You start to fall away. And then, boo. How did I even believe? I was so foolish. That's how it works. Jesus Christ is the source of light and life. And when you cling to him, he turns on the lights and he abides with you to bring that light back on for you. I love the, one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples before his crucifixion is he brought them out into the garden. Remember this in John 15? And he shows them the grapevine. And he gives them a really tangible, crystallized illustration for them to understand this very concept. He says, guys, Look at this grapevine, right? You see the vine, you see these branches coming off with grapes on them. He says, okay, don't forget this. I am the vine. Y'all are the branches. So here's how it's going to work. If you stay in me, right, like a branch on a tree trunk, if you stay in me, I'm going to stay in you. But if you stay in me, you'll bear much fruit. Look at these grapes. And he points over to these dead branches on the side of the road. But apart from me, You can do nothing, right? Any branch that doesn't bear fruit is is thrown into the fire and burned, right? It's worthless. But if you stay in me and my words stay in you, you will bear much fruit proving to be my disciples. Stay in me. Cling to me. I am the source. If this morning the lights are out for you spiritually, there's a chance that it's because you walked away from Jesus. (laughs) That's what happens. All right, you want an illustration of your own? Go home, look at a lamp, unplug it, see what happens. <laughs> Don't use the battery flashlight on that one. <laughs> That's how it works. You cling to Jesus, you build a relationship with Jesus, and the lights start turning on, you start believing, you start understanding, and then you slow down in the rhythm, and the light starts turning off again. I love how Jesus abides with them. He turns on the lights, he ministers to them, he serves them, he doesn't get mad at them. He points out the truth of their state, that they are foolish, they're slow to believe, and yet he abides with them as they become believers. And these men who started out in the story, walking away from Jerusalem, going to Emmaus, wondering about what happened. By the end of the story, they're going to Jerusalem, they're hanging out there, they're spending their time with Jesus. They are worshiping him with abandoned hearts because they know the identity of the resurrected one. This Easter, as you celebrate, I don't care if you have an Easter bunny in your house. (laughs) Chocolates, baskets, whatever. But the most important part about Easter is that life is in Jesus. It's in the Son. If you have Jesus, you have life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. Cling to him. Hold on to him. Abide in him, and he will turn the lights on for you. Let me pray for us, and we'll respond in worship together.